The Bible tells us the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So what does that mean? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. There is spiritual weaponry, but it's not carnal. When we look at the armor of God, we think of Roman soldier. We think of a physical soldier. But Paul tells us that we don't fight like this world. So why do we apply the Roman soldier to Ephesians 6 when Paul tells us that we fight not of this world or like this world? And so what we end up happen, what ends up happening is we start because we have a wrong understanding of the scripture, we start developing this unnecessary militancy. And we're always having this mindset of fighting all the time, when in reality it has nothing to do with the fight that you perceive it to be. It's mm. good. Let, let me let me explain something. Look up the word kiss. I've said this many times. The word kiss in Song of Solomon chapter two. It's the Hebrew word. And it means to fasten the lips like a kiss. So, but it also means, and you can look it up. It means to arm with weaponry. That's what that word kiss means. It means to arm with weaponry. It's, in, it's actually found in Song of Solomon, chapter two, where it says, where the, where the lover is talking to the bride groom and she says oh lord kiss me with the kisses of your mouth and that word kiss means it, it means a kiss it means an act of romance and love but it also means to arm and fasten with weaponry those who kiss the lord and the lord kisses them are armed with spiritual weaponry because the fight is not like this world the violence that speaks of the kingdom is a is a is a love of of the pre, a love of god it's for lovers the bible says in the in the book of revelation in the last half the body of christ is addressed not as fighters but as kings and priests to their God and a bride. So, I, I saw I saw this video that mm -hmm. I can compare that to was uh, there was this guy outside preaching. Right. Right. And uh, there was a lot of people being hostile towards him. Yep. You know, and I don't know if you're a guy, <coughs> but like somebody threw a drink right in his face. Right. You know, and without like a a flinch or a, you know or anything mm -hmm. he just proceeded you know and that did more the fact that he just breezed by that and did more it, it did more than any physical altercation could have right you know and you physically saw it in the crowd where it's like wait why didn't he react that way why is he still preaching love after a drink got thrown right in his face you know so the reaction of the action of loving did more than a violent act oh, so yeah. i can totally see where yeah where that how that works it, you, you even kind of see it during the civil rights like during dr martin luther king right people were throwing stuff at them they were beating them up and they just blessed in return where does that come from scripture because we don't fight like this world immediately that disarmed the enemy yeah, or like the, the scripture you said where they sent the, the women and children first. That's exactly where we're going to go. That's it. Now, now here's the reality. The reality is the Bible says, bless those who curse you. That's what that man did. The act of blessing is actually a priestly function. The priests in the Old Testament, they were responsible for... Um, the worship of the presence of God, the sacrifices to the Lord, and blessing the people. 
And so when people insult you and, and say all these crazy stuff, the response now is that we as believers bless. Why? Because we're not like this world. We are to function as a priest. So, um, I want to talk to you about the armor of God today. Okay. And I just want to, I just want to say something. The armor of God has nothing to do with the Roman soldier. When we think of the armor of God, we think of a Roman soldier with a helmet, with a bunch of like chain mail breastplate, with a big shield, with a big giant sword and, and a bunch of like sandals and a big belt. That's exactly what we think of. But the problem with that is there's major problems with that. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. Give me one second. We've been having funny weather, so we're all like all coughing and stuff. <laughs> but the problem with that is that it cannot be talking about that. And here's why. Because Paul is actually quoting Isaiah 59. Let's, let's go there. Um, I want to show you something. Let me see if this pulls up and I will have a, a separate upload for this teaching, um, at the right time, but I want you to see something. I'm going to turn to Isaiah 59. I want to show you this Isaiah, Isaiah 59. Look at this. This is powerful. We're talking about the armor of God. Okay. Let me see if I can kind of watch this. Look what it says here. This is Isaiah 59. And look at this. It says, then the Lord saw it. This is verse 15. And he says this, and it displeased him that there was no justice. So the Lord is looking around and the Lord is being displeased because there was no justice. And then look at what verse 16 says. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. So immediately what we're seeing here is that the Lord was looking for justice, but could not find it. And he was looking for a man and was wondering why there was no intercessor. Now mark this word intercessor. And then I want you to see this right here. And it says as follows, therefore his own arm, which is the Messiah, which is Jesus, Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Now, look what it says here. He put on righteousness as a breastplate mm. and a helmet of salvation on his head. This was written way before the Romans, way before the Romans even were there. So we're seeing some key words here. Verse 16, intercessor. Yep. We're seeing the word, therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. The Lord's arm. The word salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua. He, this is speaking of Jesus. And his own righteousness sustained him. And he put on righteousness as a breastplate. Does that sound familiar? That's in Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Wow. Then he talks about having on the breastplate of righteousness, but it has to do with intercession. It, see the weapons of our warfare are not like soldiers that fight. It's intercessors that are raised up to do warfare God's way. Now watch this. And a helmet of salvation on his head. 
and he put on garments and vengeance for clothing and a clad zeal as a cloak according to their deeds according he will repay now what is this breastplate that is speaking of here well the way that the breastplate was understood in the old testament was the breastplate that went upon the high priest that had the 12 stones of every tribe of Israel. And the high priest would put that breastplate on. It was considered the righteousness of God because that high priest would enter into the presence of God to make intercession for the people. That is the breastplate that is being referred to there. And the helmet of salvation is speaking of the miter of the high priest that on the, 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 the miter or the helmet of the high priest had the words inscribed holy to the Lord. But it says, but it says there, it says there that it's a helmet of salvation. And the word salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua. It's the helmet of Christ. It is Jesus as our high priest. See, the, the armor that speaks of, of a, in Ephesians is a direct relationship with Isaiah 59. And so those who fight are not fighters that have a sword and they're wielding things around. No, the sword is the word of the Lord, the breastplate and the helmet of salvation and, the, and, 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 and all of the armaments are priestly garments. Why? Because the scripture says that he has made us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests to our God. And when you have, when you see yourself as not some soldier wielding a, a giant sword, but as a priest, carrying the presence of God and going into making intercession, you will see that this is how you fight. I want you to see something else here. The priest in the Old Testament wasn't just someone that was just locked up in the temple. The priest was actually part of the military of Israel but they did not fight like the rest of the tribes of Israel at all how did they fight you made the scripture mentioned a few times second chronicles chapter 20 look at this you ready here is the king of Israel He says this. I'll just read the whole thing. There's a real problem. There's a real threat. The Moabites are encircling Jerusalem. And the king, Jehoshaphat, is terrified. And it says this. It says this, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. I'll answer questions at the end for time. For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. So here is Jehoshaphat. And the Moabites are encircling Jerusalem and he has no idea what to do. And this army is too vast and it is too great for Jerusalem. So he says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now all of Judah with their little ones and their wives and their children stood before the Lord. The word Judah, the tribe of Judah in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 13 is the tribe of praise. Now look at what happens. Judah, all of the tribes of Judah are there, and the wives and the children, those who are 
the most weakest, most dependent, stood before the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, who's a priest, in the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all of Judah and all of inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be dismayed or afraid because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. Now notice something. The tribe of praise and the, and, and the dependent little ones, the ones that were most weak in society, stood before the Lord when the priest, began to prophesy. Now, the activity of heaven and the strategies, my God, of heaven were released through the priest. Do you see that? So here's the king, he's terrified, and the priest is the one that's getting the download from heaven. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's tomorrow go down against them they will surely come up from the accent of ziz you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of jerul you will not need to fight in this battle you see it has nothing to do with a carnal fight he says position yourselves and stand still and see the salvation of the lord position yourselves how do you position you stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Salvation of the Lord is the Hebrew word Yeshua. It stands still and see Christ, my friend. Now watch this. This is the strategy of heaven. Because in Ephesians chapter 6, after mentioning the full armor of God, he says to the Ephesians two times, he says, stand Having done all to stand, stand therefore having your, your loins girded with truth, your breastplate of righteousness, stand still. This is how we fight, understanding we are priests, intercessors. Watch this. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. Now watch this. Look at this. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head. He understood that when the priest spoke, it was God speaking. Why? Because the priest was the intercessor, was the, was the gap between heaven and man. And what are we? A kingdom of priests. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord. And what was the response? What was the response, Jojo? They worshiped. It says this, the response, they bowed his head to the ground, humility and the inhabitants, and they were worshiping. Worshiping. You see, this is how we fight our battle. Watch this. Then the Levites, verse 19, and the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. What is happening? The priests now, after hearing the divine response, they begin to stand up. The Levites, the children of the Kohathites, the children of the Korites, these are the priests. They stood up to do what? Fight? W wield their swords around? No. What did they do? Praise. Praise the Lord God of Israel with voices, what? Loud, Loud and high. high. This is how we fight. This is how we engage. And watch this. So they rose early in the morning. That's good. They went out to the wilderness of, of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood. Look at this. He says, hear me, O Judah, the tribe of praise. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem is the city of peace. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, look at this. What Look at what he says here. He, the king, appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should sing praise to what? The beauty of holiness. 
as they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing praise, the Lord <laughs> sent ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. How, they, how were they defeated? They were still. They began to praise the Lord. King Jehoshaphat had discernment and wisdom to understand that we're not fighting a regular battle here. So I'm going to take the priests and they're going to go before the armies and they're going to sing praises. And what, what are they going to do? They're going to praise the beauty of the Lord. Look, praise the beauty of his holiness. And as they went out before the army saying, praise the Lord, his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing praises, the ambushes were now given from the presence of God and the enemy was destroyed. This is how you fight your battles. This is how we are to engage. We're not a bunch of Roman soldiers slinging little gladiuses around. We are a nation that is wholly devoted unto the Lord, a culture of priests. Do you see that? Now watch this. Let's, can we find more of this type of warfare? Yes, emphatically yes. Watch this. So the priests provoked the presence and the power of God was released to destroy the enemy. Those are types and shadows. Those are types and shadows that are seen. I'll respond to questions at the end of the stream. I see some of your questions. They're good. And I have answers for that. Just, just let me kind of teach my way through it. Now watch this. The priests praise the presence of God. The presence of God destroys the enemy. You see that? Praise provokes God to move. This is how we fight. The Bible says that in the New Testament that everything that Israel went through was for our encouragement and our consolation and our understanding and learning. Watch this. And it came to pass, this is, this is uh, Joshua chapter 4, that when the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Let me see if this is the one here. Is this it? Let me see. Da, 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 da. I'm sorry. Give me one second. I think I went to the wrong. There it is. Sorry. And it's so good. It's good, man. I'm telling you. Because we, 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 we're, we constantly are struggling and fighting and seeing ourselves the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why we're, we're, hitting, we're hitting walls constantly. Yeah. That's not our position. Our position is a priestly one. Right? Yeah. So look what it says. This is uh, e, uh, Joshua chapter four. Uh, 3 verse 14 so it was when the people set their camp to cross over the jordan that the priests who was there the priests bearing the ark of the covenant the ark of the covenant was the presence of god before the people and those who bore the ark who are the priests came to the jordan and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped at the edge of the water for the jordan overflows all its banks during the time of harvest that the waters which came upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, which is the city beside Zeratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off. And the people crossed over the opposite of Jericho. How did they cross over? How did they transition? They, they went through the priestly function now i'm going to explain that in just a second verse 17 then the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the jordan 
and Israel crossed over the dried ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. So what is the context of this passage here? The context of this passage is quite simple. Joshua becomes the new commander of Israel after uh, his, uh, his predecessor, Moses, the man of God, the servant of the Lord, dies. And then the Bible says to go to the Acacia Grove, you're about to cross the Jordan. The, the, the word of the Lord spoke to Joshua, which by the way is, is, the, is the Hebrew word Yehoshua. This is Christological. It speaks of Christ. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. Joshua was the captain of the, of, 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 of the people of Israel. Now watch this. The scriptures say that the Lord spoke to Joshua and he says, listen, go into the Jordan. There's a big bank there. Tons of water is being rushed everywhere. How can we cross over this? And God says, take the priests who bear the presence of God and have them stand at the edge of the banks. And when they did that, the rivers and the, and the Jordan ceased and they walked on dry land. What does that show you about the things of God? That openings, transitions, guidance, all come, all came through the priests first. And that shows us a kingdom dynamic, a kingdom reality. That when you take your place as an intercessor, when you put on your priestly garments, so to speak, when you understand that you are a priest before the Lord, you will make a way where there is no way. And it's not because of you, but it's because of God's functioning within you. When you take your place to understand your position and your identity as a son, a child of God, but a priest... You praise your way through the transitions. You fight in a different light. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Watch this. Here's another one for us to consider in the book of Joshua. If this is blessing you, please give it a thumbs up. I will respond to questions at the end. There's a lot of things I want to cover real quickly. Let me see if it's mine is getting blown. I'm soaking it all in. Good, I want you to. Man. Watch this. Let me see if I can find it here. I see why uh that oh. song is made way make. Oh yeah. He makes a way. He makes a way, but how? Through praise. Through praise and worship. Why? Because we're his priests. And what God does when he releases the activity of the earth, he does so through praise. Why? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. Man. And just changing the perspective of, of the armor. Mm-hmm to being loving and yes they give that gives a whole different perspective on my testimony that i had when i felt the armor being put on me right it gives me a new perspective on how to view that armor that was placed on me wow. and how to use that armor that was placed on me that's powerful bro look at this ready look at this right here look at this Verse 8 of Joshua chapter, I think this is 5 or 6. Give me a second. I'm having a hard time finding. Come on. Look at this. Joshua. I think it's, this is the 6th chapter. Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, proceed and march around the city 
and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. Now, what's going on here? The walls of Jericho. Jericho was a fortified city. That was the first conquest of Joshua. He needed to take those Jericho, the, the stronghold of Jericho. Listen if you have ears. There was a stronghold called Jericho. And Joshua is getting direction from the Lord. And he says, look, I'm about to, I'm about to do something. And Joshua was a man of war. He knew how to fight. You would think that he was going to do some strategy that was in his expertise of carnal warring. But God says, you're not going to do none of that. This is what you're going to do. I need you to get the priests. Because I'm going to do it myself. So look at this. It says, then, then it says, verse 7, And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that seven priests bearing the seven trumpet rams, horns, uh, before the Lord in advance blew the trumpet, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard after the ark. While the priests continued blowing the trumpets, now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout. He tells them, be quiet. Don't say a word. How many times when we're in prayer, God says to us, be quiet, don't say a word. Man. And it says right here. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then he, they came to the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning. And who? The priests took the ark of the Lord. Then the seven priests bearing the seven trumpet rams, horns before the Lord God, went on continually and blew the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. But it came to pass that on the seventh day, they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city. Now, the dawn of the day, before the day even arose, there is something about an intercessor waking up before the twilight, before the dawn, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On the same day, they marched around the city seven times. And on the seventh time it happened, that when the priests blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, now shout, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Wait a minute, it, even, it didn't even happen yet. So they're seeing the city. He says, guys, shut your mouths. Don't say a word. Then he says, priests, I want you to go around the city. Praise. Blow the trumpet. Do it seven, seven times. And then he says this, in the dawning before the day broke. And then on the seventh day, he says, shout. The Lord has already given you the city. That shows you something about spiritual warfare you don't need to see it with your eyes you just have to see it with the eyes of the spirit to see that thing already done Man. and so your response now is now to praise the lord that has already been accomplished for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal we don't fight like the world fights we are not to be led by what we're seeing or what we're feeling from the outside. We're to tune our ear to heaven and believe what the Lord has already accomplished and hallelujah our way through the promised land. They took a victory lap. Before, before it, they it, even saw it. Before they even. Now watch. Now look this. Shout for the Lord's given you the city. Verse 17. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord's destruction. And it, sh and it, and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live, and she who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that went. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. He says, don't even touch the things of this world. You don't want the curse on you. That's a call of holiness right there. And make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. 
But all the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord, and they shall come to the treasury of the Lord. Now watch this. Now why would he say that? Everything that was bronze, everything that was golden, everything that was silver that belonged to the Jerichos, that the people at Jericho now became an object of veneration to the Lord. Look what it says here. So when the people shouted, when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened that when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout that the what fell down? The wall fell down. Then the people went up to the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Why? Because when you listen to the word of the Lord, when you listen to what God is saying, when you do, when you fight the warfare God's way, and you see yourself not as a fighter, but as a lover of the presence of God, as a minister, as a priest to the presence, you will see the victory that's already there. Now, let's go back to Ephesians 6. I want you to see something, because I'm about to break down the armor. Now watch this. Are you getting something? I hope you are. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now let's just stop there. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in yourself? Be strong in your armor? No, be strong in the Lord. That, what does it mean to be in the Lord? Position yourself in him. Position yourself in his presence. Position yourself in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in your intercession. Be strong in your minute. Be strong in him. How can you be strong in someone? You've got to go into that person. You've got to go into the presence of God. Your strength is found in his very presence. And the power of his might, the word power is the Greek word dunamis. It's devil blasting, dynamic, explosive, miracle working power. That is found not in your own efforts, but in his presence. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. This armor has nothing to do with the Roman soldier. It is the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles. Now somebody needs to hear this, but y'all there's so many of you that are engaging the wrong voice and the word wiles means trickery did you know that the devil is way smarter than you did you know that the bible calls satan an evil genius one of the words it says for the uh uh in in, in the book of john when when jesus is speaking to the disciples he says the ruler of this age has nothing in me he's about to be cast down and judged that word is translated as evil genius let me tell you something. We don't magnify the enemy. But I need to tell you this, that the enemy's been alive a lot longer than you and I. And what he does is he tricks you. The wiles of the devil is trickery. So while you're over here, you know, fighting the enemy, he, there, there's trickeries that are being performed on you because you keep seeing yourself as someone that is trying to wield a sword instead of putting on the garments of intercession and taking your place as a royal priest, shutting the enemy up and not giving him any place. Come on. I'm preaching here. Oh yeah, I feel it. I feel it too, bro. Ooh. Feel that sweet anointing to preach. The armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or trickeries of the devil. Look at what he says. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's, we don't fight the, this, the way the world does. But against what? Principalities. Against powers. Against rulers of darkness of this age. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. How are you going to take a Roman soldier outfit and start slinging at things that you can't even see. See, the armor of God is, is all about that priestly dimension of Christ. Look at what it says here. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Your fight is not with your brother. And let me tell you something else. Because of this mindset of this Roman soldier outfit stuff, what it does is this. We start seeing people as enemy. Yeah, we, start, true. we start being so militant that all we do is start rebuking people and we call ourselves godly. When in reality, nothing can be further from the truth. You are just being carnal. Man. And you call it discernment, but you're in carnality. Man. And meanwhile, the devil's like, I got you. And you're wondering why you're still stuck there. Because he's got you. Man. <laughs> That's so good. I'm going to have this on repeat. Yeah, have this teaching on repeat. Now look what it says in verse 13. Therefore... Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Other translation says stand in the evil day. Look how many times stand is mentioned in verse 13. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand or stand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Stand is found three times in verses 13 and 14 alone. What do you think God is trying to tell you? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and take your place as priest. Stand still and see Jesus. Stand still. Why? Because the Lord is the one that fights for you. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Other translation says, your loins. Did you know that there was actually a sash that went around the high priest? The truth is that, and that sash was red. And the truth is, Jesus Christ, who became our great high priest, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate, the ephod, it's that, it's that intercession. Now watch this. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now notice it doesn't say sandals. Notice it doesn't say a foot covering. It's having shod your feet or having girded your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now what? Why is that important? I'm about to do backflips when I explain this part. <laughs> Notice there's no covering for the feet except the gospel. Do you see that? Having shod your feet, the preparation of the gospel of peace. This actually comes from Isaiah chapter 52. And we're going to go there. You see, all of this needs to be properly interpreted with scripture. Look at this. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Other translation is who brings the gospel, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims, there it is, salvation, Yeshua, who proclaims Jesus, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So the, the feet shod of the preparation of the gospel of peace, people think it's a sandal. It's not. What, what is the covering is your naked feet with the gospel of peace. Now, why am I now? Why is this important? I'm going to show you something. Because of this reality. Let me find the exact scripture. Let me just find it. Uh, where is it? Yeah, Job chapter. Check this out. Job 12, 19. I'm going to read this. Notice that the soldier. The, the, wep, the armor of God, rather, is the feet. There is no covering for the feet. Now watch this. Now, why, why is this important? Because of Job chapter 12, verse 19, I want you to see something. Come on. Sorry, my program's acting funny. Let 
Where is it? Give me one second, guys. I'm sorry. Job 12, 19. It should be this. Okay, we're at Job 12, 19. But this is a different trans. Why is this? Interesting. It says it says it differently there. Give me one second here. Come on. Ugh, this is give me a second, guys. I want you to see it for yourself. Let me find the resource. Okay, let's go here. Look at this. This is powerful. Job chapter 12, verse 15. Behold, he, the Lord, restrained the waters and they dry up. And he sends them out and they inundate the earth. With him are strength and sound wisdom. The misled and the misleader belong to him. He makes the counselors walk barefoot. He makes the fools of judges. He loosens the bonds of kings and binds their loins with a girdle. He makes priests walk barefoot and overthrows the secure ones. Now, why is that? Now, why is that there? Well, if you do a good study on the function of the priests, the Lord commanded them that when they're serving in the temple, that they ought to have no covering. They were to walk barefoot. That was actually part of the, when the priests went into the temple to minister to the Lord, they could not have any shoes on. Why? Because of Exodus, where it says, where God, what does God tell Moses? He says, take your shoes off for the place which you stand is holy ground. He says, he says again to Joshua, take the sandals off your feet for the place which you stand is holy. So what we see here specifically in the book of Ephesians, let's just go there. Chapter six. <clears throat> here it is. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, why is that important? Well, number one, the gospel of peace is the gospel. But our feet are naked, which implies we ought to we ought to bring the gospel from Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are they that preach the, the feet of them that preach the gospel. We should preach the gospel from the holy place. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We we should come from the mountain, we should come from the temple, we should be barefoot when announcing the good news. We come straight from the presence of God, which is a priestly function. And then it says this, above all, take up the shield of faith, which you are able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. What is the shield? Well, the shield is right here. Let me give you an example. Ready? What is the shield of faith? Psalm 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. Psalm chapter 3. Let, let me give you some scripture. Come on. Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. I am helped. I am helped. My heart exalts. With the song I give thanks to him. The, the shield, Psalm 3, verses 1 through 4. Lord, how many adversaries have increased? Many are those who rise against me. Many are those who say of my soul, there is no help. Give me one second. I'm not reading from... Uh, I'm reading from... Um, it says this, Psalm 3, verse 1 and 4. The Lord, you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory the one who lifts up my head. 
to you I cried with a loud voice, and he answered me out of his holy hill. Psalm 28, verses 2 and 7. Verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. Psalm chapter 33, verse 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 84, verse 9. Behold our shield, O God. Look upon the face of your anointed. You see, the shield is the Lord himself. And now why would it say, take the shield of faith? Ah, sorry, my programs. Why would it say, take the shield of faith, which is able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy? Because without faith, it is impossible to please God for they that believe in him must, for they that go to him must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The shield of faith is the Lord himself that you have faith in. Why? And you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. <clears throat> and then look, take the helmet of salvation that goes back to Isaiah 59, 17. That he was given a helmet of salvation and a breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the spirit, which is not this. It's the word of God. And then it ends to further the case that this is a priestly um, uh, vestment of the high priest to further the case. Look at how he ends. Verse 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And in this view, be alert with all perseverance, petition and petition for all saints. Those are priestly functions. I'm going to make a separate video on this to get, to get a little bit more straight to the point as an upload when time permits. But take your position. The, the armor of God is the priestly function. Function. That's so good, man. That changed my whole view on a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. I just look. <laughs> I just look forward and in, in the future to have that perspective to work through stuff. Oh yeah, and you can have it now. You just have to spend time. Yeah. You know. This is, this is how we engage in warfare. It's not through the militancy of the world, but in the priestly kingdom dynamic of the spirit. This is why a praying person accomplishes more than a person who takes things into their own hands. And it goes back full circle. Notice in the beginning of the stream, a lot of striving, a lot of distractions. The moment we started loving and magnifying the beauty of his holiness, he undid all of the striving for us. Yeah. Simple. The belt of truth was already mentioned. It's the, it's, it's the girdle that went on the high priest. But, um, yeah, I'll give more and more details. I know this was just a quick synopsis of what I wanted to say, but, um, I'll do a separate upload whenever I get a chance to really break it down with like verses and chapters and good imagery. And if you want to know more about this, this is not a new idea. This is very scriptural. There's a brother named Mark Blitz. He's a Jewish uh, teacher, powerful anointed man of God. And he talks about this extensively. And so at first, when I heard him say that, I'm like, this makes no sense. But when he started breaking it down, I was like, my Lord. That's how I am right now. <laughs> I'm getting blown away. Man, that's how I am right now. This is why... When you are still and when you know your place and you praise your way through and you worship and you spend time with God, you accomplish more than thousands of efforts. Why? Because it's your call. 
it's kind of like this. It's like a water faucet, right? And there's a pipe, okay? And the pipe is not aligned under the faucet. But once you get on that pipe aligned under the faucet, there's a flow. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is that we start, we start operating under a different carnal perspective of, of, of this stuff. But once we understand that our place is the presence of God, that we are a royal priesthood, we're a holy nation, we are meant to be ministers of his presence and be ministers of reconciliation to the world. There's the flow. Yeah. Pray prayerless people push. Prayerful people flow. Mm. Prayerless people push to make something happen. That's good. Prayerful people simply yield and flow. Why? Because out of the presence of God, out of the secret place, out of your intercessions and out of, out of your fellowship with Jesus, there is a flow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, this brother is done. It is now that time. If you can, please like the stream, share, subscribe to the channel if you haven't had a chance. Visit our website at fathersglory.org. Consider partnering with the ministry, visiting us uh, to donate, to, par to partner with us. Text the, text the word glory to the number 801-801. All proceeds uh, goes directly to the ministry of Father's Glory, and it helps us create more content become an effective media ministry, preach the gospel throughout the world, and also help support churches in Central and South America. Okay? God bless you. We love you. And we will see you tomorrow in Jesus' name. Also, also, check out our YouTube short that just came out. Blessings. God bless. Amen.